All right, here we go. We're going to start talking about the um, more complex processes of the uh, ovarian and uterine cycles in a female. And so this first part of it, we're going to <clears throat> discuss what happens during oogenesis. So it is oogenesis and not eugenesis, even though it kind of looks like that if you've never seen the uh, word before. All right, so in a male, we had spermatogenesis. That was the process used for sperm cell production and oogenesis is refers to the production of female gametes. It actually takes years to complete. So it has some key differences from sperm cell formation in a male. Um, actually it begins, and you may have heard this before, that there are egg cells present already in the ovaries of a developing fetus. And so those cells are called oogonia. And those are diploid cells. So they're two N, they have 46 chromosomes, and uh, they multiply by mitosis. So they're stem cells, they're going to be a source of the oocytes themselves. And they store nutrients. These are big cells, so which means you know they have a nucleus, but then they have a whole lot of cytoplasm. They're, the cell volume is much higher than uh, typical cells in the body. Okay, um, some of these oogonia become primary oocytes. So remember we had primary spermatocytes in males that kind of start down the pathway of meiosis. Same thing here, the primary oocytes in females have 46 duplicated chrom chromosomes. So 46, the DNA of each chromosome has been copied and those two copies are attached to each other. And um, so these primary oocytes, what they do is they start going through the getting ready to complete meiosis one, but they stall in the first parts. And again, these cells are called primary oocytes. And now remember we have follicles. Those are the housing for these oocytes. And these primary oocytes are in a type of follicle called a primordial follicle. So there's your oocyte and the primordial follicle consists of these flat granulosa cells that form a protective layer around the outside of that primary oocyte. All right, so when a female is born, uh, it has always been presumed, for a long time it has been presumed that when a female is born she already has her lifetime supply of primary Oocytes. Some of that information may be in a state of being reevaluated, so that could change down the road. Maybe there are new primary oocytes that develop from oogonia uh, later in a female. But conventional thinking has been that the oogonia that are going to become primary oocytes that happens before birth in a female. So these primary oocytes sit around in the ovaries of the female. You know, as she's going through childhood and on into adolescence. And each month, after these are very long-lived cells, obviously, so they're sitting there taking in nutrients and so forth from the blood supply in the ovaries. Each month after puberty, a few primary oocytes become activated. So they kind of start heading down the pathway that leads to ovulation. Ovulation. So notice each month after puberty, a few are activated and start going through these maturation processes, but only one typically is selected each month to resume meiosis one. Okay, so you get a primary oocyte and it undergoes meiosis one to become a secondary oocyte. So if you remember, meiosis one, the primary oocyte has 46 duplicated chromosomes, meaning two identical chromosomes that are attached to each other. And um, after meiosis one, the uh, corresponding uh, pairs of those duplicated chromosomes separate into two cells. And one of those cells is the secondary oocyte, which now has 23 
duplicated chromosomes. So these are now considered to be haploid cells. So these are analogous to the secondary spermatocytes in the male. Okay. Um, now, in contrast, in a male, one primary spermatocyte leads to two fully functional secondary spermatocytes as long as no errors have occurred. Uh, in a female, it's different. You only end up with one secondary oocyte that's actually functional, and this is a very large cell, which uh, has the nucleus in it with these 23 duplicated chromosomes, but then it's hogging all of the cytoplasm and the organelles, or almost all the cytoplasm and the organelles of the original cell. So it's an unequal division. So instead of a cell like this becoming two equal cells, when a primary oocyte divides, you basically wind up with one cell about the same size and then this other pipsqueak over here which also has the other set of 23 duplicated chromosomes. Those have to go somewhere. That little wimp cell there is called the first polar body. So it's not a functional cell. It's basically just a trash can for the extra set of chromosomes that we need to get rid of. So that's a key difference between oogenesis and spermatogenesis. Okay, so the secondary oocyte um, starts undergoing all the processes that are needed for meiosis II. In meiosis II, you've got 23 duplicated chromosomes in there, and the two copies of each are going to segregate into two daughter cells. But that doesn't occur in the ovaries. So the secondary oocyte starts down those processes. It gets ready to complete meiosis II, but it doesn't go through the whole thing. It actually stalls. And this is the cell type that actually gets ovulated. So it moves into the fallopian tube. Okay, and so this secondary oocyte starts traveling down the fallopian tube. And if it does not get penetrated by a sperm cell, if there's no fertilization, then the secondary oocyte just decays fairly quickly. It's not even, it's not viable or, or functional or alive for very long after ovulation. If it does get penetrated by a sperm, and we're going to talk more about this later, the secondary oocyte completes meiosis too, and this is with a sperm cell. Now, a sperm cell is much, much, much smaller than this secondary oocyte. This is, the secondary oocyte is a big mama cell, and sperm cells are little bitty cells. So, a sperm cell enters in there with its DNA. The sperm cell has a set of 23 chromosomes. And after that has happened, the secondary oocyte will actually complete meiosis too. So it's uh, 23 duplicated chromosomes. Those copies of each of the 23 will separate from each other. All right, and then one set of those chromosomes gets pinched off as a second polar body, and again, it's like a trash can for the uh, extra set of 23 chromosomes. The rest of them remain with the original cell, and so temporarily this cell is now an ovum. So the ovum is the mature egg cell that has just one copy of each of the 23 chromosomes, and they're not in a duplicated state. Okay, and so those will combine with the 23 chromosomes on the sperm that has fertilized this ovum. And then those chromosomes are going to get together, and now you have 46. So you're back to the normal number of chromosomes that you have in a, in a cell of the human body. And now you've got the full set of genetic recipes to develop a new human being, and one copy of those genetic recipes came from dad, one copy came from mom, and that's going to lead to the, blend, the blending of characteristics that you have between a mother and a father. Okay, this is a pretty good figure, 2719, from your textbook, which uh, over on the left-hand side is showing you the meiotic events that I just described to you, so I'm not going to rehash all of that.
That's what we just talked about over on that side. <clears throat> These little loopy guys over here are your polar bodies. Oh, and incidentally, the first polar body over here, I didn't mention this, uh, it can undergo meiosis too itself, just like the secondary oocyte does. That may or may not occur. And if it does, then at the end, you wind up with three polar bodies and the one fully mature ovum. That's very much in contrast with what happens during spermatogenesis, where you have one primary spermatocyte that leads eventually to four functional sperm. Now the follicles over here, follicle development in the ovaries. And again, the follicle names do not correspond always to the name of the oocyte, so don't confuse those things. It's real easy to get confused on that. So they start off as primordial follicles before birth. Um, and then those primordial follicles become um, they're present during infancy and childhood. Uh, they'll start heading down the pathway of being primary follicles, where the cells actually, you still have just one layer of cells around the oocyte, but they get taller. They become cuboidal instead of squamous. Uh, during a monthly cycle, some of those continue to mature and become secondary follicles, generally only one during each cycle becomes a vesicular follicle. That's the fully mature follicle, which we talked about in an earlier lecture. And inside there, the big giant cell in there is that secondary oocyte, um, which forms just before ovulation takes place. So that's what actually gets punted out of the ovary during ovulation. And then remember we talked about earlier how the cells that are left over from that mature follicle undergo changes and become the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is actually a hormone producing structure, and we'll be talking more about that shortly as well. Here's a comparison, um, I think I've already talked about all of this, but a comparison of oogenesis and spermatogenesis. Didn't talk about some of these error rates though. Uh, with spermatogenesis, the error rate is only about 3 to 4 percent. An error could be an inappropriate separation of the chromosomes. You know, typically if a, uh, a cell has an inappropriate number of chromosomes, it's non-functional. If you don't have those genetic recipes in the right number in a full set of all of them, uh, a cell is not functional. Oogenesis you only end up with one ovum at the end of the whole thing and three polar bodies, two to three polar bodies, depending on if that first polar body actually divides and finishes meiosis. There's a pretty high error rate with oogenesis, though it's about 20%. Usually if there are errors, then that oocyte is going to be non-functional, so it's not going to result in a pregnancy. Sometimes it does, though. For example, a Down syndrome occurs, can occur, uh, after a sperm fertilizes an egg, if there wind up being th three copies of chromosome number 21 instead of just two, uh, that leads to Down syndrome. So that could occur because a sperm had two copies of chromosome number 21 instead of just one, or if the ovum had two copies of chromosome number 21 instead of just one. That is uh, that leads to the condition known as Down syndrome. Usually when that happens, you know, if it happens with other chromosomes typically, like if you end up with three of, say, chromosome number 15, um, then the developing embryo isn't usually viable. It won't survive because you just don't have the correct amount of those genetic recipes that you need to function. The oocyte is unusual, again, as well because it's a very large cell, and um, as a primary oocyte divides into a secondary oocyte and a polar body, then the secondary oocyte develops, divides into the second polar body and the ovum. Um, the ovum contains, is a huge cell to begin with, and it hangs on to the uh, interior contents. So it's a very big cell, and that's neat because the oocyte has to have lots of nutrients to um, 
support the early cell divisions that are going to take place after, uh, after fertilization takes place. Because if an oocyte gets fertilized by a sperm, it's going to take six to seven days for it to travel all the way from the fallopian tube where a sperm fertilized it all the way down to the uterus where it's going to implant. So it takes, it's got to have a lot of stored nutrients in there to support those, those types of things. The poor little polar bodies, little wimpy cells that just are mainly a set of chromosomes degenerate and die, as far as we know. All right, so that's kind of an overview of oogenesis. Um, lecture number 13, we're going to talk about the ovarian cycle, and here's where we're going to start progesterone and uh, what these hormones do and how all of these things are coordinated so well that each month a female goes through the monthly cycle that leads to ovulation and also the changes along the inside lining of the uterus. The changes along the inside lining of the uterus are called, referred to as the uterine cycle and we'll actually uh, talk about those changes separately. But that'll be, we'll start, uh, we'll get started with those topics in lecture 13.